before I start the press, I just wanted to talk a bit about who I am, just to give you some context. So uh, I'm a virtualization architect for fuel storage, uh, my regional role, so it's uh, a travel involved. Um, uh, I've been there a year today, no, sorry, a year yesterday, so uh, that's pretty interesting. Um, I'm a V expert, um, I've got three caps, DCA and DCD. Um, long time in the industry, worked in pretty much every vertical you could imagine, uh, and come up with the whole stack, so from help desk all the way through to an architect. Um, I co lead the Melbourne VMUG and also the uh, OpenSAP user group in Melbourne as well. Um, that's my blog, CraigWords.org, and you can follow me on Twitter <coughs> at CSWord. So that's just a bit, a bit about me uh, before we start. Yeah. So I've got a bit of an agenda. Um, the, the idea really is, is um, to try and be a bit more educational about the, the all flash field and not specifically talk about pure. Obviously, it's a vendor presentation, so I will be delving into why pure compared to uh, other technologies. Uh, but I really want to kind of delve into the anatomy of uh, NAND flash technology and give you some kind of perspective on how it works and what makes it different to traditional magnetic disk. Um, also going to try and provide some kind of an independent view to see how Flash has been implemented in the data center today. And, and really, as a conversation piece, talk about some of the pros and cons of the, the different uh, methods of uh, implementation. And really try and get you guys to have a chat a bit more about you know, what the pros and cons of those different methods are and why some are good and why some aren't so good. Um, then I want to talk about the benefits of Flash specifically. So some of them are going to be really obvious, like performance, but there's some other ones really that probably aren't so obvious, but can actually uh, really impact on, on how you use Flash in the data center. Uh, I'll then finish on having shown five differentiators for pure storage specifically, and then I've got a demonstration showing our uh, vSphere web client integration. Uh, so let's get into it, yeah? Okay, so the NAM of the NSSD. So, how NAND flash is um, fabricated is exactly the same regardless of the different types. You've probably heard these terms already. There's single layer cell, uh, enterprise multi layer cell, multi layer cell, and triple level cell. And I heard um, they were talking about quadruple level cells the other day as well. So that's going to be uh, pretty interesting. But really, what this means is it's the number of bits that we put actually, or that's put actually into each of the cells that make up the, the SSD. And I'll, I'll drill into that a bit further. But essentially, it means like, you know, SLC is one bit, um, MLC is two bits, TLC is three, three bits. Yeah. Um, the MLC I'll call out as well because that's quite an interesting one. Uh, what you find with the MLC, it's pretty much the same as MLC. The difference is, is that there's actually a reserve capacity for um, for trim to be able to find failed uh, cells in, on the NAND flash die and then basically provide that. Uh, additional capacity for use during that failure. So I'll talk a bit more about what the use case of that is and why you use that. Um, so really interesting, uh, NAND flash is actually analog. I, I, I didn't realize this at all. So what happens is, is that a voltage is applied to the cell and then the resistance that voltage is me measured and then that's converted to a bit that then determines what state that cells in, so whether it's a 1 or a 0 or one. And you can see there the different versions, basically. We have a number of different states based upon the voltage that's measured in that, uh, in that cell at that point in time. And that kind of equates to this concept. I've got something graphical that kind of displays it a bit more, but you, you've got the concept of a cell. There's like 32K cells in a, in a page, and then there's 124 pages in a block. Uh, 1024 blocks in a, in a plane. And the, the blocks are basically sandwiched together in that plane to actually create the, the NAND flash die. Uh, you can see the capacity of the, the cell determines then all the way down to the kind of size the SSD is based upon the NAND flash dies on the SSD itself. And so I, I kind of try to show that uh, pictorially. So we've got the 32K cells. And each of those cells is a, in a block, so 128, um, sorry, 32K cells in a page, 128 pages in a block, 1024 blocks in a plane, and you can see there, an NAND flash die is actually a bunch of planes sandwiched together. Uh, I don't know if you've heard, there's recently a, um, a, an announcement of using 3D, so you've got to love the marketing guys, so 3D NAND flash, which is basically just sandwiching NAND flash dies on top of each other to provide extra density. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's really just about how much capacity we get onto the NAND flash diode. Uh, I've got some examples here of um, SSD drives. I just want to kind of drill into them a bit and show you the differences. 
uh, compared to them. So this is a, um, I'll just do some description first. This is a, an SLC drive, the 8 gig uh, NAND flash dies. Uh, what's interesting about this is that the PCB, the uh, printed circuit board, is only printed on one side. Uh, if you turn it over, there's actually nothing on it at all. And the resistors there as well, they're actually surface mounted. So as part of the process, the resistors are actually mounted onto the motherboard. We look at the newer versions here. I'll come into that a bit further. But if you look at the newer versions on these ones, and the actual resistors are printed directly onto the, um, the PCB. They've also all got uh, controllers as well, as well. So you can see here, they're all Samsung branded ARM uh, processors. So pretty much like a uh, you know, storage array, uh, same components. And then, and then obviously we've got the, the NAND flash die itself. So I was saying that there's like um, 10, 8 gig uh, NAND flash dies. Then we've gone on to, uh, th these ones are actually printed on both sides. So you turn it over, there's more NAND flash die on the other side. And there we've got like 64 gig um, NAND flash dies. And then with the 2015 release, 3D, 3Ds, I don't even you can see that there's actually a depth, there's an increase in the depth. And these are 128 gig uh, NAND flash dies. So you can see that the technology changes. We've gone, you know, in a couple of years, we've gone from 80 gig to, ter to a terabyte. You know, that's that's a, a big change in a short uh, space of time. All still using SATA 3 interfaces, which makes it pretty interesting. So that hasn't changed at all uh, over that period of time. Um, what I also want to do is um, just talk a bit about an experience I had at um, Santa Clara a couple of, probably like late last year, about October, November last year. So as part of going over to the US, um, for our sales kickoff, I actually went to a flash memory manufacturing facility, and that's pretty interesting. Like, what, why would they be uh, manufacturing flash in Santa Clara in downtown uh, Silicon Valley? Well, they're not fabricating the the uh, nano flash itself. What they're doing is they're assembling the components. And what you've got here, this is this machine that actually prints the um, uh, surface mounted um, capacitors actually onto the uh, uh, the uh, printed circuit board. Uh, it's really interesting, the, the assembly process is pretty much automated, but there's still a need for human uh, intervention because basically the people there are all doing quality uh, Q and A and, and making sure there's quality control around how that um, SSD is actually being manufactured. So, so there's a need for us, we're not gonna disappear overnight. We still need humans as part of this process, which is, which is good, yeah. So I'll just have a quick drink. So, so why do we need to treat NAND flash differently? I think there's some important points here. So really the difference is around the whole program versus array cycle. So I don't know if you're, you're aware of this, I'll just jump back to this picture a second. So I should put it a bit closer, but although we can um, read and write on a cell level, we can only actually erase on a block level. So it means that um, during that erasure process, we have this thing that happens called write amplification. So it means to actually erase the data out of that block, I've actually got to go read all the pages on that block, assemble them and actually move them to a clean block before I can erase that block. To solve that problem in SSDs, Trim really uses these two components. We have garbage collection, which is basically going around looking for uh, blocks that aren't being fully utilized, taking the pages out, and then moving them to a, to a new block. And we also have this concept of we're leveling. We don't really want to be writing to the same cell all the time, because we write to the same cell all the time, it's going to like fail in about three, three months. I think the, the write cycle for a TLC drive today is probably about 150,000 writes. So you can imagine, you know, on a traditional storage array, if I'm using SSD, it's probably not going to uh, last particularly long. <coughs> Um, so I just want to thank Wikipedia, um, I stole this from Wikipedia, but I really want like to show basically what that um, garbage collection actually means and how it actually works here. Yeah? So you can see here, we've written A, B, C, D into this particular block, and then what we've done is we've written some new blocks, so we've got uh, new pages, sorry, E, F, G, and H, and then we've actually changed the state of A, B, and C, so we've got another version of those A, B, and C, and D there. So the idea of garbage collection is a background process. They'll go and look at this block. It'll see that there's free space available, and actually go and write the new data that's unique that's required to continue to a new block on a new uh, to new free pages on a, on, a, on a new block. The other diagram really is just showing this concept of um, uh, you know like uh, write amplification. So again, I'm writing the 4K blocks, but I have to move them around. I've got to shuffle them around outside of the Sorry, write the 4K pages, but I've got to shuffle them around outside the blocks to be able to um, 
distribute the I/O across the, the SSD, but also I want to look for empty empty blocks so I can write new data. I don't want to be going back and trying to change that data at a later, a later date. I just want to always write to new blocks. Um, was, was there any questions around around any of that? Because you know I think it's really important to understand how SSDs work. There's a lot of you know hype about them right now. There's a lot of information about them. And, they're not like magnetic disks, they're different. So, was there any questions or anything about any of that? Well, have you got an SSD to show people? Or pictures, that's it. Oh yeah, yeah, I'll talk about that one in a second, yeah. But, um, I'll do that. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, Andrew. So we're giving this away tonight. Um, there's actually an interesting story about it. I, I did the uh, Auckland beam of last week, and we only did a, we only gave away a 120 gig SSD, but this is the, um, Samsung uh, 850 Evo, and this is 3D VNAN, so it's, you know, this is the whole idea of having an NAND flash drive sandwich on top of each other. But for 20 bucks more, so the, the 120 gig retail for 129, so for 149 I got a 250 gig. So that kind of shows you the, the density and how it's changing from a consumer perspective. Uh, you know, we're seeing a rapid growth in the uh, density of SSD. So, you know, again, I think it's really important to understand how an SSD functions. Thank you, Andrew. Was there any other questions? Yeah, go for it. Have there been any improvements in how long they actually last for? Like you were saying, the kind of particular areas that they can die fairly quickly if they use a lot. Mm -hmm. Has there been any progression in kind of... Well, well I guess, you know, it's a great question and it kind of leads into where, where, where we go with this, um, this presentation. But I guess the point is, is that really you want uh, a flash solution that kind of understands this. And actually, you know, addresses SSDs globally across the solution, as opposed to relying on the trim uh, process on a per SSD basis. So, so these these background processes actually work out of the box in the firmware on SSD today. But the problem is, is that it's only within that particular SSD. It's not globally across every single SSD in a in an array. So as you add more capacity, if you add more that this kind of like garbage collection and write application actually occurs within the SSD. So uh, you know. Great lead on question, but I guess that's kind of the point we're trying to say is, is that it's really important that we do this right. So we've considered this, and I'll talk a bit more about what we do to kind of solve some of these problems. Yeah, yeah I was just wondering, um, given the nature of SSDs, is there like data decay through um, long term storage? Yeah, great, really good question. Um, what, what's, what's really important to understand is when a, when a cell fails. So when a cell fails, the, the state of that cell is actually as though there's data on there. So, so when, when the charge is lost, it'll actually, uh, it's, the analogy is like a balloon. If I have a balloon and I blow it off over a period of time, after a while it'll actually get fat and saggy because you know, it's been expanded and compressed. And that's exactly how a, a flash cell works. So what happens is when a cell fails, it actually has a state of one. So it, it you know, that sort of control that it's not going to understand the SSD is going to look at that and think that there's actually data on there. But it's not until the point comes when it actually tries to read and address that data that it's actually going to realize that the data is wrong. So, you know, it's something that you need to get from an SSD. And I think that's kind of the, you know, the, the challenge is, is understanding having a solution that will actually address that particular problem. So that's a good question. Yeah. <coughs> Anymore? Okay, so, so next I want to kind of provide a bit of a, you know, obviously represent a vendor, but I, I want to try and provide a bit of a, a, an independent view of how Flash is being implemented in the data center today. And really talk about, you know, this, because the purpose of this is to build some discussion within the group. So I'm really going to, I'm going to go through these three tribes, and I'm going to talk about the pros and cons. And, you know, obviously when we get to all Flash, there'll be no cons. It'll just be pros. But, but seriously, I, I do have some in there. Again, I'm trying to show. Uh, the differences between them. So, so let, let's jump into it. So the first one's retrofit. So what does that mean? Well, that's like basically replacing all the hard drives with SSDs in an existing array. Okay. So what, what are maybe some of the pros of that? So, you know, it's so no, no product, yeah? Okay, so I've dealt with that product, I understand it. We're just swapping out the, the medium. Uh, easy upgrade path as well. Again, I'm not changing hardware, I'm just upgrading the components within that existing hardware. Um, and what are some of the cons? Well, you know, is it controller software actually programmed to address SSD? Because if it's not, then typically what you'll find is that um, they'll be using some kind of EMLC grade um, SSD, and then they'll be relying on the capacity, additional capacity that, that you're paying for, but not actually being able to access because it's reserved for um, cells that are dying in the NAND flash over time. 
Uh, another con, uh, lack of SSD related software features. So, you know, we, with an SSD, you're going to have a high read capability, and, and you know, write, write capability is pretty, pretty good compared to magnetic media as well. But how do you utilize that additional benefit? So, so this two on each, two pros and two cons. Any, anyone got any other um, pros or cons they can think of for this particular uh, style of flash implementation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what do you think? It's going to be cheaper, or? Well, I'm not sure where it isn't. Mm. I mean, you know, I agree there's going to be a cost as far as purchasing EMLC, you know, compared to just consumer grade uh, SSDs. Yeah. There's going to be a big difference in cost, and I guess as well with the capacity side of it as well. You know, so. Lack of choice. Say again, sir? Chain. Yeah, it depends where you're going to do it. So, are you doing it within the array or are you doing it within the SSD? And, that, and that's kind of the. The situation I was saying before, Trim exists. It's just it's just within the SSD. It's not globally within all the SSDs in an array. So, um, right. Um, would the uh, the controllers of a, a, a spinning rust array have enough horsepower to actually be able to make take advantage of uh, SSD spin? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I, mean, I mean, you know, if you think about this scenario, you know, these controllers are they're actually programmed to think about things like you know spinning on platters and you know. Moving heads and things like that—they're actually made and built around solving those mechanical physics problems. But we're not going to have those problems with SSDs. Jeffrey, one more. Yeah. Um, with because they're used to mechanical drives that heat and the power and that require mechanical, are they right. going to have a higher running cost due to the extra yeah. effort yeah. they need to do for something yeah. that doesn't even exist anymore? Brilliant, brilliant. So, so today, like, who's running their own data today? Uh, hands up if you're running your own data. You know. Okay, so who's not running their own data? Who's outsourcing their data? Yeah. So, the, so things like power and cooling become important, you know, because you might be actually paying for, for that on an ongoing, that's operational ongoing cost, you know. Yeah. Well, there's also the point that um, for efficiency, data centers should be run at about 24 degrees because of the heat tolerance. Now, how does SSD? Handle the heat variations, yeah. Well, I mean, that's how you traditionally have a cold out of the bar, you know. Yeah, well, that was the thing that they found that the efficiencies and uh, cost efficiency at 24 degrees is good. The people who object are the engineers that go in there because it's too hot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's some kind of quite clever ways of dealing with this. Yeah, building power and the data center these days, when you talk about the, the Google ones and stuff, you're all, you know, talking about fair wind, wind power. Yeah, water cooled, hydro cooled, those kind of things. You know, hear stories about uh, DCs where they, they use the heat from the DC to warm the water up for, uh, for the town where the DC is based, and then sell that back to the council for water. You know? But even more than that, I mean, old equipment was um, subject to thermal overload. So once you hit a certain point, your temperature just kept going up. Yeah. These days, most equipment can run in any. Any room in the house. So yeah, that's really good points. Yeah, I agree. Really good points. Thanks. Yeah. So we'll go to the next one. So hybrid. So what's hybrid? Well, hybrid is basically we've got a combination of SSDs and, and hybrid drives. So this could be a tiering kind of technology, could be a caching kind of technology. And you're really trying to accelerate the um, the I/O in cache before it hits the um, the hardest tier. So what are the pros that? Well, buying less SSDs for a start, so it's going to be a cheaper solution. And then I've got my magnetic disks as well, which come, you know, I combine them today with six terabytes. So, you know, I'm getting, you know, maybe potentially a greater capacity. That makes sense, yeah. But what are the cons? Well, you know, tiering might be difficult to manage. I mean, I, I mean, pretty much these days, most storage solutions have some kind of auto tiering built in. But, you know, if you look at some, uh, you know, JBOD uh, SSD solutions, it's down to the administrator to determine the placement of that uh, VM. You know, the, 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 there's one I, I, I've used, I'm not going to name any names, but what, what would happen is it would calculate on a schedule. So every 24 hours, it would a calculation of where the hot blocks were, and it would move the data into the hot blocks. Well, what good is that? I mean, the hot blocks might have changed in the last two hours, let alone. Um, and then I think the other key one really is this whole concept of the active working, active working set. So what you have to do is, with these particular solutions, you have this complexity of size in the SSD tier so that all your VMs, all your active working data will fit within that SSD tier. Because as soon as that um, VM 
uh, runs outside the patient into a just like that, that performance impact is going to affect your environment. Any, any other pros and cons? Anyone want to chip in with any other ideas? Anybody using hybrid today? Yeah? Quite a few there. Yeah. Yeah. So, a, a, any other ideas about what's good about it, what's bad about it? So all flash, all SSDs, no power disk drives, yeah? pretty easy to do. But, uh, <coughs> pros, with load consolidation, I've got all this performance, I've got this I.O., I can service multiple different kinds of workloads simultaneously. Enough performance to provide data reduction in line. So, you know, the moment today, the challenge is, is that SSDs are great from a performance factor, but what about the cost associated with it? How do we drive down that cost? Yeah? And, and some of the cons, again, cost versus capacity, perhaps, yeah. Excess performance, do I need all these ions? Is that actually of use to me in my organization? Any any other pros and cons anyone can think of? Come on, it's a discussion. Come on. You work for an audience and capacity. If there's one fault in that type, you would still make a difference. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough, yeah. Okay. It was something we touched on ages ago, which was accelerating your VM implementation using SSD caching. Um, so if you're running an array, can you select a segment of set array and allocate that purely for, say, level three location? Yeah, I mean, you know, I guess ultimately it's like, you know, how, how do you know, I mean, I mean, I guess that's kind of related to active working, certainly. I mean, how, how do you know, how do you work that out? What was the, does anyone have a good formula of working out active working, set? I mean, Number of you get, so yeah, it's pretty complicated. That's what I'm trying. You know, it's not something. I think mean, you know. Often, you know, I've designed solutions out before, and often it's been about, you know, let's look at the, the amount of backup, the amount of changed data in the backup, and determine what's actually being changed, because that can give you some indication of what's actually active. But it's not, you know, it's a fine, it's a science. It's not, it's an art. It's not something that's easy to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, with SSDs, because they were based on um, right, if you have real heavy ride intensive jobs, can they sort of reduce the life of then of the SSD? Yeah, for sure, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and again, it's back to the architecture of the, the storage and how you're dealing with the flights. Because, you know, SSDs are, you know, fantastic read performance. But, but ultimately, the right performance is the And that's why, like, SLCs came out first. Because the SLC, you've got a single bit. Yeah, really good, right performance. But the challenge with that is it's, it's cost inhibitive. And that's why you've seen, like, yeah, MLC and TLC coming up. It's all about manufacturing cost. Yeah. So, Nathan. So, why have you got excess performance under a con? What do you, well, I'm buying performance, do I need it? That, that's kind of more. Yeah. But, yeah. But I mean, I'm, I'm trying to always provide. provide that's a con. Like, there's a perception. Yeah, that, that is a perception that, oh, it's all flash. It's going to have way too much performance around. But it also can be a pro. So, mm. some customers can say, if I can de risk the. <coughs> Excuse me, position of putting myself in that I'm going to have a performance problem in six months down the track, then Flash actually could be a profile excess performance. Would be well, a I think it goes back to the whole work with open consolidation piece as well, because potentially you've got that extra performance, why not utilise it? So. Like yes, risk, risk mitigation as well for, for you know, the what? performance status that I know, performance data that I know about. Yeah, 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 yeah. the unknown, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, Again, it's that, you know, like measuring uh, active working status is what. Yeah, what what metrics can I use to actually determine that? You know, it's not. But as, as head of high, um, as head of finance, I don't want you to spend that money today. I want to spend that money in six months. When we saw a few slides ago that you've just doubled your capacity, or more than doubled your capacity every six, twelve months. So if I hang on to that cash that you've just spent on performance you don't need, I can go and buy some more storage in six months and I'll get more for it, and it'll be faster. Maybe you had to buy the storage because it needed the capacity. But not the I.O. You've got to get in at some point, don't you? Yeah. you know what I mean? you have and, a, and not every head of finance is correct the same as well. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as, I, I literally have a customer say that to me that I don't need all this performance I'm going to buy because I don't know what I've got. My guys can't tell me sure, actually yeah, yeah. what they've got a fair amount of understanding of what they what they need to provide for. We don't know actually what's a, we can kind of predict capacity for the next three, six months, whatever, but we can't actually predict performance. Someone turns around and says, well, now I need a Windows 10 desktop, you know, for hundreds of Windows 10 desktops versus Windows 7 or XP desktops, and the performance profile is actually slightly different. 
or yeah. a sequel plus is on each of them. So there's a whole, yeah, it's kind of like a, a no, agility really. thing, isn't it? Being able to yeah. build, build the capability to react to whatever business is doing. That's where the thing, cost versus capacity and performance trade off actually starts. Mm -hmm. really yeah. important. You're buying insurance. The question is, it is, if Flash is cheaper than the server, why wouldn't you have the excess performance? And that's where it's going to be in the next year or two. Okay. So the, the no, question, or well, the, the thing, thinking that I was reacting to initially there was SLA management. So some operators in the environment will not want to over deliver on performance because that may degrade over time. And some people might, have, might get an expectation that the Flash is awesome, and then later, you, you know, especially when it's new, then you start consolidating really heavily and you start getting choke points. You go from two microseconds back to yeah. one millisecond, and then everyone goes, oh, it's crap, but yeah, yeah. the SLA was, was 10 milliseconds. Yeah, no, that's, it's really good. I mean, typically what you find, the people making something like Flash, is that you just move the bottleneck somewhere else. And typically, you either move it to the network or you move it actually to the compute. So, yeah, at the end of the day, you're just going to shift the bottleneck somewhere else. So you're not really going to. Yeah. One more? Any more? Yep. Um, just in regards to the inline uh, reduction, I guess one of the other things that could be a bit of a economy with Flash is. Digitification is an unknown, so you know you might buy 15 terabyte of raw disk capacity, but get actual usable, you can't go to finance and say we're going to DG on a three to one ratio, so we're getting yeah, five really good terabytes, yeah. and it's a big unknown depending on your yeah, environment, which is going to change over yeah. the next three to five years. I mean, I mean, you'd want to like kind of test it out almost when you go out to see what rates you're going to get. <coughs> it's a really good point. So. Um, that's really a comparison in different ways, and I kind of want to summarise now what you know, what are those benefits. We've talked about quite a few things here. You know, let's just go through them really quickly. So, predictable performance, low latency, high bandwidth. So, uh, reduced power and cooling. You know, we talked about that. Reduced uh, rack space as well, which I think is quite an important thing there. Increased hard hardware lifetime as well. You know, it's not there's no moving parts. You know, uh, you know how, how many hard drives are you? Changing over your data center per week or per month at the moment has been online too. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So uh, workload consolidation, obviously, we talked about that uh, as well. And then this old concept of this ma massive parallelization of I/O. So the idea that reads are free, but you know, writes cost. Um, particularly as well when you bring in, take into consideration write and publication. You know, so if an array is not able you know, to understand this addressing an SSD, then it's that write application is going to occur on blocks yeah, by actually reading the data and writing the data for that block. So that can have an implication on the solution. So, um, kind of pivot a bit now. This is kind of the idea was just to get an overview of SSDs and flash technology and why, you know, the use cases and the benefits and those sort of things. So, you know, now I'm going to like kind of pivot into pure storage. And I really want to just have five takeaways today to show you what's, you know, what's unique about the platform and what the benefits are. So. We'll talk about you know how we deal with write amplification. We'll talk about uh, designing and managing capacity and not performance and the implications of that. Uh, data reduction built in always on. What does that you know what does that mean? Uh, auto alignment as well. So you know we we actually um, actually uh, manage data on a 512 byte uh, granularity. So it means then that you know you're not actually dealing with with alignment of the partitions. And we'll talk about that a bit more. And then this. Finally, this whole concept of a non-disruptive upgrade. So it means that you can start small and then grow into a larger solution. You're not actually locked in. Uh, so, so let's drill into that. We'll go into a few things here. So, you know, I actually just <coughs> took and paste this from the, the Pure Storage website, and there's a ton of information here. The purpose really isn't to you know, read every single sentence out on, on this slide. The purpose is just really to show. You know, you're all smart guys. You, you can go to the website and find out more, but. The purpose is really to show that we, we have a single flash gear, and there's a bunch of things that we do to address SSD globally <coughs> on the array, which is unique to, to pure storage. Yeah. So, you know, all, all these things like, um, you know, uh, personality layering, uh, continuous background optimizations, we talked about uh, um, garbage collection, uh, wide dispersal data layout, flash geometry alignment, and uh, real time IO pos monitoring. So, you know, really the idea, what, what, what does all this mean? Well, it means that, you know, a traditional SSD that you buy from the manufacturer today, so we'll, let's have a look at our MLC guy here. I think it's got, yeah, five, five year limited warranty. So that's what Samsung provides with its MLC. So because we do all this stuff, Samsung's actually warranted our 
uh, the SSDs that we use in our solution for you know, 10 years plus. So, and that kind of has all, you know, all manner of consideration and it's like, you know, in three years time, do I need to change components in my solution? Do I actually need to have a forklift upgrade? You know, I can prolong the life of the SSD. So I don't need to change this technology anymore. You know, what, what's the point in forklift every three years if I can retain the, the life, lifespan of the SSD beyond 10 years? Yeah. If your SSDs have got a 10 year warranty, though, what about the appliance itself? I mean, I think that's probably where most businesses all start looking at replacing things if your appliance is only three or glad you asked that question. So we have a thing called uh, Forever Flash. And if you have maintenance on, on the array, and you continue that maintenance for three years, on that third year, we'll upgrade your controllers for free. And then you'll get like the latest CPUs, Haswell CPUs, whatever. The, we're actually matching Intel's TikTok step right now. So we just released a new product, the M. And as part of that, that's using like 32 core Haswell processors in there. So we're, we're aligning to those changes. Because really, there's, you know, the, the product really, there's two things we're doing with, with, with following Moore's Law's curve on CPU, and we're following that same law on SSD density. So would that also keep in step with the vSphere version support as well, or? Oh, we're pretty quick. I mean, like, we did vSphere 6 pretty much straight away. Yeah. I mean, yeah, again, some of the benefits I mean, have been a... Older array with the newer. Yeah, yeah, fully. So, so it's the same operating <coughs> system, it's the same code, and it's the code that we support vSphere with. It's not the hardware that abstracted it like. So you're saying, you know, like we've got a, a 320, the, the first array that we produced. It's got the same uh, operating environment as the M that we released, uh, what we announced in June. Hey, Craig. Yeah. What's the use case for having an SSD run for 10 years? Uh, how do you mean, what's the use case? Why would you warranty a disk for 10 years if you don't expect it to run for 10 years? But it will. That's the, the point. Is you've, got the, you've got the capability to run it to the ground. And as long as you provide maintenance, as long as you pay for maintenance, we'll warranty it for this period of time. So just, you know, it's kind of like just looking at uh, the whole way that we refresh um, hardware and storage in our data centers and looking at it in a different way and not forcing you as a vendor every three years to forklift out a solution or pay, you know, an overhead tax of uh, maintenance. You know, we, you know that, that's what happens is that they'll say, right, well, you either pay, pay you know, two and a half times the maintenance or you buy new controllers and it, typically the, the idea is, is that they're going to get you to buy new controllers because they want you to be on the latest and greatest, they don't want to be supporting so, older hardware. Do you have any stats on the failure rate of this in your rate? Thank you, that's a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think we've been, we've been uh, going for like four, four years now, four and a half years and in that time we've had like 12 SSDs fail. So that, I think it's something like 700,000 SSDs that we've got in systems. 12. Um, moving on then to the whole design managed classic not performance. So we've all been in here. You, know, you can see some of the names here. You probably know what this is. Uh, the whole idea is that you know, we're not managing we're not managing RAID groups. We're not managing aggregates. We've got this cool thing called RAID 3D, and I could spend the whole of this presentation talking about RAID 3D and how, how cool it is and what we do. But again, you smart people, if you're interested, go and look at the website. There's some really good videos, there's some really good deep dives on what the technology is. But it means that you're not, we're not designed for performance anymore. We're not building RAID groups for, for spindle count, for IOPS. We're not, it's all gone. Yeah? What we're doing now is we're managing runs for administration. So, you know, like if I want, you know, if I, how do I want to carve up this capacity? What am I doing? Am I, am I doing it because of, you know, it's more Am I doing it for different customers? Is it different BUs? Is it different workloads? Yeah. And, you know, if you want to run, you know, I don't know, four runs that are 62 terabytes, or if you want to run 400 runs that are 2 terabytes minus 5, 12 bytes, go for it. Yeah, it's up to you. There's no, there's going to be no difference in the performance impact on the array behind the scenes. Yeah. It's just a, a, a logical um, construct for the, how we write the I.O. to the, to the array, yeah. So, it also means, you know, no tiering, obviously, we talked about before, but no hot spares as well. So we're actually writing segments and putting dual parity into the segments, which means then we strike those across the disk. 
if we um, sorry, if we pull two discs out of the race, it's dual parity. If we pull two discs out of the race, we can actually watch cal we can actually watch parity being recalculated on the ray line. But we're only moving segments. We're not moving this this not complicated group where we're reading from the remaining discs to rebuild that hot sphere. We're not doing that, okay? That those segments we can, you know, depending upon the how how full the array is, those segments could be rewritten in a couple of minutes, you know. And it means then once we've reached 100 percent capacity uh, parity on the on the array, we can go and put another two SSDs. All that's going to happen is, is that that capacity is removed from the solution. That's it. Nothing else here. So we we often do uh, demonstrations at some of the events, and we'll have an array and we'll pull out. I mean, yeah, there's no there's no actually running data on the array, so we can pull all of them out. <laughs> a large number of lines. But the point, the point being is, is that as long as we're reaching parity, we can continue to pull them out. Because you know? it's just capacity that gets removed at the end of the day. It's not like. Yeah. That one there, that? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, that reduction built in always on. So, what I wanted to do is kind of show you the IO uh, process and how we do reads and writes. You know, it's, you know, it's pretty unique to, to pure storage. It's kind of what the DNA of the problems is. Uh, th these are tunables, they're on all the time, uh, and there's some kind of benefits to the way that we do it as well. So, that's sent from a host. You know, first of all, we'll do pattern and zero removal. Okay, we'll store it in the memory on both of the controllers, and then we have a thing called uh, NVRAM. So, on, on our disk shells, not on the actual controllers on themselves, the controllers are completely slated, but on our disk shells, which have an NVRAM drive. What we do is we, we achieve NVRAM quorum, so we, we have it in non in volatile memory and we have it in non volatile memory as well. And at that point, we've got a, a copy of that data that we can retain if there's a power failure or if there's. So, so at that point, we actually acknowledge the host. We actually do a right acknowledge to the host. So, what I've done is these things in memory. So, it means we can provide sub millisecond latency pretty easily because we're not actually doing anything with the data, we're just copying it to memory into NVRAM. Once that's done, what we'll then do is we'll actually do a deduplication, a compression, checksum, calculate the parity. So I was talking about these segments with dual parity. And then we'll, we'll, we actually build a 56 meg segment and we'll lay that across the SSD. And then in the background, as part of like uh, the system wide garbage collection, we'll actually then do a post process dedupe and compression as well. So the whole idea is really is to reduce the capacity used for that data. Which you know has a number of benefits. It obviously means that we can get, you know, imagine a, a storage array that you buy, but then you can get four to one or six to one data reduction. So you're actually getting six times the capacity of the raw disk that you're, you're purchasing. That's crazy. I'm getting more than what I paid for. That's, that's crazy. Oh, sorry. Is there any questions around that? That's all. Any questions around that? The yeah, I that. Darren, what kind of data reduction do you get from the data coming in? What for the different workloads you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so we actually have a it's pretty cool. we have a, a stock ticker on the website. <coughs> we use this thing called Cloud Assist to, to take telemetry from all the arrays of all the customers that we've got, and we publish our dedupe and compression and even thin provisioning because that's what other vendors use. But not that it's really uh, data reduction or not. But um, so typically with BSI, we're getting on average total across the board of about five point five to one. Uh, which I think equates to like 12 or 40 to 1 if you're using thin provisioning, but it's a joke if you are. That's not really, I, mean, I can make them look as big as I want to. Um, but that kind of equates to, um, so if it's a server virtualization, we'll get um, you know, pretty good dedupe, you know, because we've got multiple copies of the same operating system. Uh, probably about 5 to 5 to 1. If it's VDI, then we'll get, it'll be fantastic because it's just a bunch of copies of the same operating system, so we can get anywhere from 12 to 15 to 1, depending upon whether the clones or persistent or non-persistent data is used. And then for databases, we get really good compression, so we can typically get around 3 or 4 to 1 compression. Um, so they're the kind of main three workloads that we work with today. Obviously, because we're compressed and deduplicating, we wouldn't recommend we, you know, uh, JPEGs on here or you know, file system data because you're not going to get that maximum return on your on the capacity of the solution because it's already compressed. Now, you know, we've had customers where they're using ARM on or SQL backups and they're doing compression software. You know, we recommend you turn that off when you do it from the array. But even then, because we're doing it at this 512 byte uh, granular level, 
we can still get better compression than the software compression that you get on your on the Amazon backup or on the SQL Server backup. So we can still get something, but we'd recommend like that you you know you turn it off everywhere and just use it on the natively on the array. Compression now. Go for it, money. Yeah, quick one. So it does garbage collection happen all the time? It's a background process, yeah. yeah. So it's pretty much on all the time. Yeah. And it's, do you see a drop in the right performance when that happens? Not at all? Because no. what we'll be doing is we'll, the, the, the SSD that we'll be doing garbage collection on. So, so when you write an SSD, it's serial. So I can only ever read or write. I can't do both at the same time. So what's pretty cool is, is that if we lock out two SSDs, where we're doing garbage collection at that point in time. What we'll do is we'll use parity bits on the other SSDs to actually go and calculate the data that's on those SSDs that have been uh, hit, you know? So it basically means that we're doing error checking all the time because we're reading from parity and we can't access the data on, on that SSD. Uh, so uh, we talked a bit about the 5, 4, 5 granularity. Uh, really simple. Um, because we're doing 5.12, it means that we have no alignment issues. Who, who's, ever, um, moved, who's ever created a 1 meg partition at the front of an operating system partition and moved it? Glorious, isn't it? Such a great use of guitar and day. You know? How long did that take? Huh? Three years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why are you still doing that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great stuff. So, so it doesn't matter what well, you put the deck on there and we'll align it for you. We, we're so granular that we just ignore that. It's no problem at all. Yeah. Um, so finishing off on the whole non-destructive upgrade idea. So, so the concept being is, is that the controllers I said before are completely stateless. So all the MAC addresses, WWNs, IQNs, IPs, all those sort of things, they're not tied to the physical hardware of the controller. And what it means is that we can start off with the smallest model, and in place we can grow to a larger model. At the end of the day, the constraint of the performance isn't in the SSD, it's actually in the CPU and memory of the controller. So we can scale performance by having a bigger controller with more cores and more CPUs, but we can also scale capacity by adding additional trays with more SSDs. And this is completely non-disruptive with 100% performance. Everyone does non-disruptive, but we can actually maintain performance during that change, yeah? which is pretty unique. Any, any questions around that? How much capacity is it a tray? Uh, it depends on what size tray you buy. So I think they start off at uh, 2.75, 5.5, 11, 22, 48 now, I think. Or 24, sorry, 48. And I think we're talking about a 96 now as well. So again, you know, like the drives are getting bigger. As, as, as new drives come out, we'll, we'll provide more capacity. We can build a lot of go. Darren works for Pure, by the way. So, on to the demonstration. Yeah. Sorry, any, any other questions? Yeah. 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 I'm kind of okay. Great. conscious of time. So, yeah. having an array that was at 90% okay. capacity, yeah. would, it wear, would only wear level in a lot of money 10% continually, wouldn't it? Then? Well, what we do is we don't, um, we don't, we actually reserve capacity, honestly. We actually have, have a system space on, on the array. Um, so we reserve some capacity that we don't present to you. So out of that, you can see here, for example, out of that, um, let's have a look. <coughs> just, just, yeah. So you can see here, this is like a, uh, this is a, a 24 terabyte shell. But you can see that there's only 19.88 uh, terabytes available. So we're actually, you know, like any. Uh, this we've got a four line overhead. It works out roughly about we wait for you about 50, uh, 0.59, so you'll get like 59% of the capacity. But out of that, what we're doing is we've, you know, we've got system reservation. So what we'll actually do is use that system reservation to do the. Is there a maximum size where you recommend to add more of this space? That more shelves? Well, you know, this is kind of I guess the unique thing is is that because we're not we're not designed for performance, we're managing. Capacity globally on the red, and then the London's a thin provision, so I can, you know, I'll give out a 50 terabyte run to an end user. They think they've got 50 terabytes, but in the background, I'm just care, I, all I care about is making sure that there's sufficient capacity on the array, and I'm managing the capacity. Array. Obviously, I'm going to have some alerts in there to say if that run reaches 80%, then I need to go and expand it and make it bigger. But ultimately, you know, with those checks and balances in place, 
I'm just managing capacity globally on the array, and when it gets to 90%, I'll either try and move <coughs> stuff around, move stuff off it, put other stuff on it, whatever. But ultimately, then that you know leads then to uh, the growth phase where you're going to buy another tray. And, and because of our rate three D works, you add the tray, capacity is made available, and then you just continue to work. You're not having to go and have out more uh, raid groups or adding to a uh, pool of aggregate or nothing like that at all. Craig, is there any mechanism to, um, I guess, replace the channels themselves, like when you evaluate the uh, show and then? Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so right now, that's not uh, available, but it's something that will be available very soon. That's what we work. So that's what engineering are working on at this point in time. But the idea is, is when you get, you know, let us think of it, you know, like in a year's time, if you buy a 96 terabyte shell, and you'll have a 5.5 .5 terabyte shell, then you might want to use it for the lifetime of the SSD, but if not, then you can activate it. Day off there, that's two hour you that you can then use to put more capacity in there if you want. Yeah. So, yeah, good right. question. Right. Okay, yeah, last one because I really want to get on the demo. So. Just quickly, um, with the controller upgrade, you said, um, you know, it doesn't impact performance at yeah. all. And from what the website says, is the controllers, while they run together, they never run more throughput than one controller can handle at a time. Yeah, so it's when using 50% capacity. So, what it means then is if the heartbeat will kick in and within 20 seconds, transfer I.O. to the other, it'd be really good to whiteboard it, but I just, you know, it's really hard I'll to condense all that in a Yeah, I was just wondering session. if, with that, is there a, say like I have a massive peak time and I need more throughput, can you override that setting to use? No, no, no. That, that's how it is, yeah. Yeah. That, that's how the um, system's built, yeah. yeah. But, um, I mean, I would say, I would say that all the ports are active, mm. you know, on the array, so all, all the front end ports on each of the is active. So I can come into any controller and we'll do that whole copy into the RAM and then acknowledge the host, even if it's not the primary controller. It's any it's just that one controller has the ownership of, you know, once that 56 meg uh, segment of dual parity bits in there gets written to the SSD, there's one controller that actually, you know, is responsible for that. So we you know we we kind of like uh, yeah. For vSphere, for example, we recommend doing the round robin so we can push I/O across every single active path, and then we also recommend uh, configuring the staffing policy to have one IOPS to go across each interface. And then that way, if there's a failure, we need to reconvert. It's just one I/O that we've got to resend. So it's you know, really quick conversions. So, so I'm going to just do a, a quick demonstration. <laughs> I'm not actually going to talk about. I'm not actually going to talk about. Uh, DNS, eh? it's always a DNS now. because I think that's kind of a lot of best story, obviously, you know, dependent upon the audience today. So, so how it works is, is that we provide all the plugins built into the array. So when you upgrade the firmware and array to the latest version, we'll upgrade the plugins. So you haven't got to worry about maintaining the version and all that sort of stuff. And then what we do is basically, you provide the vCenter host um, uh, name, IP address, DNS, whatever, and then a one-time set of credentials. So that person who's logged into these admin rights into vCenter connect and then we'll go and do an install. So again we can also update this as well as the newer versions. But that install will just push out the, the plugin to the vSphere web client. So who's using the vSphere web client today? Yeah. Who's using um, who's using vSphere 6 as well? Yeah. Are they the same people? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so but I don't know. I, I've had uh, mixed uh, experiences with web client before but um, but um, vSphere 6 is brilliant for the web client. It's actually really usable, it's actually really snappy. So if you're not upgraded, I'd recommend it because it's, it is a big difference. Yeah. So I just got to authenticate this. How are we doing for time? I think you're at the end, don't you? 
Yeah, yeah. that's why I'm asking. It's yeah. flat 22. Yeah, how long have I got left? Uh, minus. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll try and round up pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and just basically, what I want to show is how you manage pure from within the BSO <laughs> web client. And I just want like people to understand that um, basically, because we're not dealing with aggregates, not dealing with array groups, it means all I'm doing is creating loads. I'm not doing anything else. So it really basically means I can do all that management from in, within, within the BSO web client. I don't actually need to go to the Array to do that management at all, yeah. Is it how high it is? It's on a VPN to, to the US, yeah. So something can happen, yeah. Oh, on 3G. On <laughs> <laughs> Used to be pretty good, mate. Uh, well, if you can ask some questions, if you want. Yeah, well, yeah. I'll, I'll be like five. <laughs> Six, seven minutes long. Yeah. It's 5G now. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to do it like our end users and just keep hitting enter, it makes it a shame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So I was just going to say, like, I push my uh, plugin onto the recent server, I come into the uh, home page, and there we go, the, the plugin's here. So I'll go to plugin. <coughs> So, and then basically what I do is register the array in the you know, from the plugin. So I literally cut and paste the URL of the array, stick it in there, and then provide our back credentials, so if you've got any integration, whatever, just put them in there and then connect to the array. And then what I can do is, um, I'll jump into this because I know where it's wrong. Um, so I can actually do a couple of things. Like, let's just show you the... So what we do is we basically expose all the yeah, metrics from, from our HTML5 interface into the, the BC web client. So I've got here, you know, I can, I can uh, control capacity obviously across or manage storage across the whole array, like what we showed a minute ago there. But what I can actually do is drill into a single data store. And I've got some interesting stats here. You know, I, I think that's quite interesting is that we actually show an average I.O. size. Um, so using that, I can kind of determine what the workload is. You know, if it's like sequential uh, reads, I can draw it up here. We've got details there about the um, actual uh, rewrite I/O size as well. Uh, and then on the array, we, you know, we keep the data up to a year. Obviously, we average out over time, but like you know, for the first hour and so, for the first day, for the first week, it's pretty good. Uh, and we can kind of like you know, we've got stacked read and write. We can also like uh, break them out and be a bit more granular. So we can go on to each of these and we can look at latency over time, bandwidth, um, and then you know, what importantly as well is so I can see data reduction you know, globally across the way, but I can also actually look at a particular level. So you know, thinking about those the management uh, considerations, you know, active considerations for managing runs. So maybe I want to build runs based upon use, you know, so is it a VSI environment, is it a VDI environment? Because that can get really good to understanding of what kind of data reduction I'm getting on that workload overall. And what we can also do is um, within the array, um, so yeah, obviously we can provision runs. Um, the unique thing there as well is, is that all I'm providing is how big is the loan? What's it called? On VMFS? Is it on a cluster? Is it on a host? And basically, what we'll do is we'll manage the, the back end orchestration around you know, creating the loan on the, on the array, re scanning the adapters, the storage adapters, mounting the loan on the uh, end host, building a VMFS file system, and then having the data store ready to be consumed. Yeah. And all that's kind of orchestrated in the background as part of this. You just provide a size and a capacity, you know, capacity and a name. We'll do everything else, yeah. What we can also do is obviously we can manipulate snapshots as well. So I'll just gloss over these just to give you an idea. So we have this concept of a copy to the new data store. So we can take a snapshot and then we can present that snapshot as a, as a, a clone, as a data, a clone of a data store back to those same year six hosts. And what's really interesting in the background is that we're just doing metadata reconfiguration. We're not actually moving any data when we do these snapshots, when we do clones. It's all metadata manipulation, so it means there's no overhead. So I can take a clone of a, you know, a 400 uh, gig uh, data store, and it's pretty much instantaneous. We're talking about you know, 
10 seconds, 15 seconds, something like that. Because it's just metadata pointers that we're shifting when it's all done. Um, so I can create new snapshots. I can restore a snapshot. We can restore a data store from a snapshot as well. So it means if I've taken a snapshot before a change and something's gone wrong, I can actually restore that snapshot. Yeah. Um, and also, um, and also, obviously, we can add and remove snapshots as well. Um, let's go back to conscious design. So just show you the last couple of things and then we'll, we'll be done here. Um, so obviously, you know, I can create a store, a data store, like I said again, <coughs> give it a name, how big is it, what array am I going to do it on, what cluster am I going to do it on, what, um, what actual host am I going to do it on. But what we can also do is um, add it to a protection group, so we provide asynchronous replication as part of the product. Uh, uh, part of Purity 4, um, that Purity 4 was released, customers upgraded to 4, no cost involved, uh, and they got that feature. So what we've actually done is, you know, we're trying to understand the operational overhead of managing runs, and we've integrated that into the web so really, really simple stuff. And I'll just finish on this one last thing. So we talked about multipathing before. So we don't really have to go through every single run and configure um, you know, the round robin and SAP P policies and all that. So you can do it all in one click. Right? And what we'll actually do with SAP P is we'll look for the vendor name of those runs. So if you've got different storage arrays being presented to the same ESX host. We'll just make these changes to the storage, uh, the data stores that come from pure storage. Uh, so like I said, we'll go to round, move it to round robin, change the IOPS per adapter to one. And then because we've created that in the SAP P uh, policy, it means that any future data stores that we create are going to, uh, you know, those, those policies are going to be applied to. Um, so that's it. So happy to take questions. I know we're back on time, so happy to take questions afterwards. Please, you know, come have a chat. Um, I'm going to give away the. I'm going to give this away. So we've got a, a bucket here. So usual stuff. Give us a card drop, and then I'll draw it at the end of the, the session. Um, if you want to learn more about Flash and the Enterprise, you know, we've got a, a vendor written Flash buyers guide. So um, that, that's pretty. You know, trying to be informative, not necessarily trying to provide you one direction specifically, but we've also got all our white papers. There's a couple of guys that work for Pure Storage, they know for one. Um, Cody Hoisterman basically does all the solution architecture stuff for VMware. Uh, he's got some really interesting stuff that he's, he's done around Unmap and some of the benefits of uh, unmapping vSphere 6 are pretty interesting. Uh, John Owens and Ben Trosh as well. So uh, just with that, uh, thanks for your time and I hope it was an educational and not just another vendor presentation. Thank you.